Well, good morning, Mac. Uh, we are at the end of uh, one big story, and I'm kind of sad about it. This has been a great couple of months as we've been uh, summarizing the Bible, learning to tell the story in just eight words. And today we come to the last of those words, but, but before we do, wasn't it just great to have our students leading us this morning? I'm so grateful for that. Well, if you're uh, new to church, uh, we're learning to summarize the whole Bible, as I said, in, in just eight words. It sounds like an ambitious goal, but those eight words are uh, bullet points, if you will, an outline to be able to use several narrative sentences to summarize the whole Bible. Most people don't uh, know what the Bible's all about, and I want for us here at Mac to be able to tell the story in what might be seen a, a, an elevator speech, if you will, uh, being able to summarize uh, the whole Bible in a short period of time. We need to get to the last word, however, and I'm going to tell you right out of the gate that today's word is go. It's go. And so you can add that to your list. We're going to get to it a little bit later because there's some things that we need to understand that are going to enable us to go. So I'm going to reveal a little bit more about that a little bit later. Because first, I have a story I want to tell you. Um, early one morning uh, this week, a, a pickup truck uh, comes up to the church, a young adult driver in the, back, in, the, in the truck. And in the back of the truck is this huge sofa. And it caught my attention over at the house because I was up having my uh, quiet time and I was looking out the window in the living room and I watched this truck come up to the church and then back his truck down into the gully, down by the deck in the gully. And uh, he gets out of his truck and he pushes the sofa out of the truck and onto the ground in the gully. And uh, that's when it occurred to Mary Lee, he's trying to avoid the $25 fee for taking the truck to, or the sofa to the dump. And so, um, I know, I'll just, I'll just take it up to the church, and I'll just dump it in the gully. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure it wasn't Robbie. <laughs> he never can, never can be completely sure, but... Uh, Whoever it was miscalculated one thing. And with the sofa now out of the truck and on the ground, and with fresh frost on the ground, the truck was too light to get up out of the hole. He got into his truck and he spun those tires until there was so much blue smoke, it was just all over the gully. And I could see it from the house. And so, of course, the sofa, being so big, is too heavy to put back in the truck by himself. So he calls his buddy to come with his truck, and we'll get out of here. And that's when I drove my car down to the lower lot, just to be really entertained. <laughs> you know, I, I had my cup of coffee, and I'm sitting there watching these guys, and they're watching me, and... This is even better than my devotions. <laughs> and they saw me sitting there, and, and I'll tell you what, they scurried. They put that sofa back in the pickup truck, and they quickly, both of them, drove their trucks out of the gully with the sofa. I'll tell you what, life has got so much variety. I love it. But now I've been thinking about this story all week long, and I am convinced that it is a gift from the Lord for today. And you're going to see that as we move forward this morning. Last week, we, uh, we saw that God fixed the broken world by sending His Son, Jesus, not only to die on a cross, but to be risen from the grave so that we could have resurrection power at work in our lives. I want you to take a look at the screen. Romans 8, 11. We put it up on the, on the screen last week. And if the Spirit of Him 
who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. In Ephesians 1, last week, we, we looked at this, this, that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is also at work in us. Think of it. The same power. The power that split rocks and shook the earth and even raised the dead from their tombs is the power that's at work in us in you and me who love Jesus. Now, we just got to get our heads around that before we go any farther. We have resurrection power at work in us. Because you see, Jesus didn't die on a cross so that we could confess our sins, dump our load, as it were, and then from there, just simply drive away in our own power. No, we don't have any power of our own to get out of that hole. The only way forward after confessing our sin is to depend on His resurrection power at work in us. See, my, my uh, theory and my experience from time to time is to think that I can move forward in my own power. And like, and like that truck driver this week down in the gully, 10 times out of 10, I fail. Or I end up going and picking up my sin and driving away with it. And that may be your, your experience as well. You're trapped in the gully of your own self-effort, trapped with your sin, as it were. And you have no power to get yourself out of it. And, and it's confusing to, to you because you try to be a good person, you, you try to honor God, you try to go to church. But here's the question. Did Jesus die on a cross so that you and I would go to church? The answer is no. Jesus did not die on a cross so you and I would go to church. He died on a cross and he was raised to life so that you and I would have life. Resurrection power to be animated by the Holy Spirit of God. The same power that split rocks and shook the earth and raised the dead. But here's the thing. You and I have to appropriate that power. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means you have to access it. You have to acknowledge that you have it, and then you have to depend upon it. It's not going to church. It's becoming the church. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, go to church. In one place it says that don't stop meeting together, but that's different than going to church. See, this, is a, this, uh, this whole becoming the church is a huge problem in our, in our country for our consumer mindset. Because people are inclined to ask, where is, where is the church that pleases me? Where is the church that meets my needs? But nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in Scripture, do we see that, that consumer metaphor for the church. Quite the opposite. What we see in Scripture is several metaphors, if you will, for tapping into this resurrection power as the church. And each metaphor that we see in Scripture requires complete surrender on our part. Now we're going to look at a few of these uh, today because it's critical as we come to the end of the story. Our question, what needs to happen 
to experience resurrection power. You have it resident in you if you love and trust Jesus. But what's it going to take to experience that power? I want to look at three metaphors, and then we're going to wrap up the story. The first metaphor that Scripture uh, reveals to us is that you and I are children of God. Child of God. John chapter 1 and verse 12. To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Here's another one. 2 Corinthians 6.18 I will be a father to you, And you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So, children of God, sons and daughters. One more, Romans 8.14. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons, and we could say daughters, sons and daughters of God. Don't miss this. The key to accessing the power is the posture. I am a child of God. You may know that uh, that pastor's kids, PKs, can be uh, rebellious children. That may surprise you. But let me give you a window into that, if I could. I'm a, I'm a PK. I'm a pastor's kid. My daughters are pastor's kids. The pastor's family sort of lives in a fishbowl with people looking in. And with each sermon that dad preaches, that PK feels another expectation added to the list. And whether self-imposed or not, they feel this pressure to be perfect. And sometimes PKs say, you know, I'm not living with that pressure. I'm just not doing it. And they, they choose to be in control of some aspect of their life with possibly some expression of rebellion. I remember uh, years ago uh, talking with one of my daughters about this very thing. And I, I said to her, you know, you don't, you don't seem to have struggled with that too much. I mean, you seem to be free to be you and, and you love the Lord. I mean, why have you not really struggled with that whole rebellion thing? And she said, well, Dad, it's not a very spiritual answer. And I said, that's okay. She said, what is it? And she said, well, I... I just decided that 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 wouldn't be very honoring to you. And I didn't want to create problems for you. Well, after I melted into a puddle, after she said that, I thought, that's a really spiritual answer. Because that's a metaphor for the church. Not what I want, But what my father wants, I'm his child. See, that's how you appropriate resurrection power in your life. You surrender your willful independence and you posture yourself as a child of your father. I am, you are, children of of God. That's important for the end of the story. A second metaphor for experiencing the resurrection power that's living in you is this, body of Christ. Romans 12, 4-5, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body. 
and each member belongs to all the others. Now, if you're, uh, if you're new to church, it may be news to you that when, when you pay, place your love and trust and surrender to Christ, you take on a completely new identity. You don't lose your personality. You always keep your personality. But you take on a new identity. You are now literally the body of Christ. There's that uh, familiar phrase that I'm sure we've all heard. You are possibly the only Jesus some people will ever see. But, but you're not the whole body. You're, you're a part of it. You have a role to play. And just like the physical body has many parts, so also the body of Christ has many parts. You may be a, a hand. You may be a foot. You may be the ear that listens. You may be the mouth that, that speaks. Uh, one, one pastor who had a, a congregant with uh, low self-esteem came up and said to him, Pastor, I can't imagine that I'm a part of the body of Christ. I, I can't do anything. I mean, if I'm, a, if I'm a part of the body of Christ, I'd be a nose hair. <laughs> and then the pastor quickly said, oh, but you can't believe what an important role the nose hair plays. I mean, it filters out. I'm not going to go into all of it. But what I want to emphasize here is that each of us plays a different part to form the body of Jesus Christ. But I want you to look with me at the key phrase on the screen. It's the last one. And each member, each part, belongs to all the others. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, I want you to just look around you in your immediate area. You belong to those around you. Those of you in this section, you belong to all the other sections. And we could go and do that in each of these sections. Everyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ belongs, ownership, to all the others. That's important. If you want to experience resurrection power, you ought to believe that you belong to all the other parts of the body. There's no room for willful independence where you do what you want for your sake. To experience resurrection power, you do what the rest of the body needs. Not just in our church, but what do believers in Missoula need? What do the believers in all the nations need? So we have these two metaphors so far. We have children of God. We have the body of Christ. One more. And that is ambassadors of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20 2 Corinthians 5.20 we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us. Now, what do ambassadors do? Political ambassadors uh, represent the values of the nation that sent them, right? When we were in Washington, D.C. A, a few weeks ago, a group of us went to the Canadian Embassy uh, right near the White House, this beautiful embassy. And once inside, here was the hospitality and the generosity of our neighbors to the north. They represented very well the values of Canada. I mean, how strange it would have been to encounter the Canadian ambassador to the U.S., and have him say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm here on this ambassador ticket, but actually I just do whatever I want. 
Well, he would cease at that point to be an ambassador. And he would lose his power. See, as ambassadors of Christ, we represent the values and the message of Jesus Christ. And it, it takes the surrender of our own willful independence to do that. We posture ourselves as representatives. And, we, and as we do that, we tap into this resurrection power. The power of the Holy Spirit living in us. Now, these are the metaphors that Scripture presents. And there's others as well. But this is what it means to tap into resurrection power. Child of God. Body of Christ. Ambassadors of Christ. And it's totally why that Jesus can expect us to do what he says in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. He says, therefore, go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Therefore, go. And that's the last word of our one big story. And so I want for us to say this in just a moment. God has called us not only to follow, but to go and tell the world his one big story. Can we do that? We've been doing that every week. Let's read it together. God has called us not only to follow, but to go and tell the world his one big story. This is so important. And it takes resurrection power to do it. Otherwise, you'll end up spinning your wheels in the gully of self-effort. Or you won't do it at all. Let me just take the, the last few minutes to, uh, to talk to you about this word go. You know, when we, uh, when we hear go and make disciples... It can feel kind of scary. I mean, it can feel like I've got to go and convince someone that their current thinking is wrong. And that is scary if that's what it is. But, but convincing people of the one big story is not about being a good debater or a good presenter of all the right facts and the information. I mean, some people have those bold and confrontive personalities, and we thank God for them. But most of us don't. We are called to represent Jesus, the one that we love. And I don't know, I, when, I, when I want people to love someone that I love, I mean, I don't twist their arm and Neither do I remain silent. Instead, I tell stories and I, I show pictures from my phone. I mean, I love my girls. And, and I've, I've got all kinds of pictures to show and I've got all kinds of stories to tell. And I figure that once people have seen those pictures and heard those stories, that people will like my girls too. And maybe that's more of what sharing our faith should look like. It's sharing the stories and showing people the pictures of Jesus by our actions and by our words. By caring for all people without discrimination. You know, when we, when we understand that, that we're sons and daughters of God, well then sharing our faith doesn't mean trying to sell religion. It means inviting people to be with us on an adventure as a family. When we, when we uh, live as the body of Christ, we're not trying to change the world with our arguments. 
but by giving people a picture of what Jesus looks like. When we are his ambassadors, we realize that we're not charged with changing anyone, but rather representing Jesus and his message. I really want this to be practical today, and, and so I, I want to ask, how do we go forward without spinning our wheels, but actually experiencing resurrection power? And what I'd like you to think about with me is this sentence that we've used over the years, is that what we do together is powerful. That's where the power is experienced. It's together. When we, uh, when we go locally together, you know, that's something that we can all do. And I have to say that I am so proud, in, in a humble sort of way, uh, that I'm so proud the way that you as a church are going into our community. Uh, the Mac Garage. Uh, minor car repairs for single-parent families. Some of you have been doing that for years, and you're making an impact. Your adoption and, and foster family support is reaching this community in, in a partnership with the state of Montana in, in a way that, I, this week I was thinking of the word, I think the word is shocking. It's shocking what God is doing through that. Your investment in public schools, multiple schools, is deeply appreciated in our community, and it's making a difference. This week, I, I attended an awards event put on by the Missoulian down at the MCT, where the results came in for Missoula's Choice, and uh, Mac was awarded as one of Missoula's top three churches, and I, I did this last year, but I wonder by show of hands, how many of you voted? I mean, look, show of hands, you, you voted. That is so discouraging. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. This is not discouraging. No, I'm really excited about this. Look at this. Hardly anyone voted. Missoula voted. What's noteworthy is Missoula voted. And we offer that up to the Lord because we don't need awards. Our reward will be in heaven. But I celebrate how you're going into the community with resurrection power. One, one more. Um, when we go globally, when we do that together, it's something we all can do. You know, the Bible says to, to go, go to all nations. And let me, let me say that you can do that in multiple different ways. We might, you know, check that off the list. That's not going to happen. But there's multiple ways to do that. You can go by going. I want to encourage you this week, go to Facebook, pull up Mac's page, and uh, learn about our... El Salvador trip in the summer. Look at Facebook and see the uh, China trip that we're going to be taking in fall. Open up Facebook and be a part of that conversation of where in the world does God want Mac to go? Don't rule out the possibility of going. If you take a step of faith, I think you'll marvel at how God's resurrection power in the body of Christ enables you to go. Another, you can go by giving. We, uh, we can all do that. It doesn't even matter how much money you have. I think of the story in the New Testament of the woman who put in essentially one penny. Out of her nothing, she gave what she had, and God honored her for that. We can all give. And when you bring your offerings, I encourage you, designate a portion of your offering to go to missions. We've made it very simple here at Mac. If you give by check, just write missions in the memo, and a portion, whatever you designate, 
will go to missions. I have to tell you, I am so proud to be a part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. We have literally hundreds and hundreds of international workers who are all over the world planting churches. And you and I can help. We can go by giving. Our dollars enable them to be there so that they don't have to raise money. You can have a part. Here's another. You can go by praying. You know, we can all do that. Pray that the one big story would be told in all the nations. Pray specifically for someone who is doing that very thing. You can be praying for Ron and Lisa Ramsey in Kosovo. Just doing a marvelous job of, of serving there in Kosovo. Pray for Brad and Laura Trozen in northern Iraq, very tense part of the world right now. Pray for Luke and Amy in China. And then uh, um, I'll just continue. We can, we can go by going. We can go by giving. We can go by praying. And then just this last one, we can go by participating. We can all do that. This week, Luke and Amy are coming. And I want to encourage you to be a part of that. As some of you as leaders have been invited to various workshops this week. I encourage you to be a part of that. They're bringing their three disciples with them to our church. And you do not want to miss next week. Next Sunday morning is going to be powerful. I'm talking resurrection power. Because we're going to be laying hands on these three disciples and commissioning them to take the work that Luke and Amy are doing in China. It's going to be powerful. I hope that you're a part of it this weekend. I'm going to ask our worship team to come while I continue to, to speak here for just another minute. And, uh, you know, we're now at the conclusion of our series. And I just want to take a shot at telling this story with the eight words. The one big story began with a good God who created a good world to reflect how good he is. But we broke the world, which is why we find ourselves in a world of confusion and disappointment and hurt. But here's the thing. God didn't leave the story. God remained, and he, remind, and he, he remained and, and he even promised to fix the broken world. He chose a people, and to those people he showed his character and his faithfulness and his goodness. And no matter what those people did, even though they failed him, he remained faithful to his promises. And after many years, God showed up in an unexpected and miraculous way. He sent his son Jesus, wrapped in the skin of his own creation, and he grew to be a man, and then he went and was nailed to a cross to pay for all sin, a penalty that rightly belonged to us. But here's the thing, the story wasn't over yet. God raised Jesus from the dead, and in doing so, he provided that same resurrection power to live in us who believe, and, and so that we would really have life, the life that he came to give us. And then he said, go. Go, make disciples. Tell the one big story among all the nations. And I want to I wanna just say that uh, this series is something that we need to uh, celebrate as a church. And uh, what we've done is we've made a little bookmark that's at the information counter and it has the eight words on it and the eight sentences that go with them. And you might want to grab one or two of these and just stick them in your Bible. And I was thinking that if, you know, if you're kind of a techie person and your Bible's on your phone or whatever, you don't need a bookmark. Uh, you could take this and just make it into a tent. And you could stick it on your kitchen table and there it would be in the middle of your meals, and you could take turns telling 
the one big story. But grab one of these. This is a mile marker event in our church. Become accustomed to being able to tell the story. And uh, let's rejoice this morning as we finish up worshiping the Lord. Let's rejoice for what he has done and is doing in our body.